Today I'm going to show you how the DSM is laid out in the pieces of a diagnosis and how to code and record those diagnoses. So I highly encourage you to take out your DSM for this one um, or to print out the PowerPoint. That way you can take some notes or look at it along with me. So let's get to it. Using the DSM. So in its fifth edition, 20 chapters or what I call chapters. Um, they're the different sections, right? Here we have the neurodevelopmental disorders, the schizophrenia disorders, the depressions, the bipolars, things like that. It's got 265 disorders, not counting all the different subtypes. For example, uh, there's anorexia binge purge type and anorexia uh, restrictive eating type, right? So we have all these different uh, combinations, right? These specifiers. It's got a couple assessments that you can use, a cultural formulation, right? So how to consider uh, your client's culture when making diagnoses or considering diagnoses, an alternative model for personality disorders, which we'll go into in depth in that, in that module, and then conditions for further study. That one is kind of a list, a short list of up and coming um, diagnoses. Uh, you can't diagnose them yet, but they're there for, I guess, feedback and to kind of be aware of what those symptoms would look like. And they include things like non-suicidal self-injury disorder, suicide disorder, uh, internet gaming disorder, to name a few. Again, like I said in the previous video, there's no access system now. So when you're making a diagnosis, you're putting the number of the diagnosis, the name of the diagnosis, in any specifiers. And I, I promise, if you feel like, what's he talking about? We haven't gone over it yet. We're going to do that in a minute. And you list diagnoses now just in order of presenting concern. What is the issue that brought your client to your office? That issue is the presenting concern. That is the one that goes on top. So if someone said, um, I have uh, a cocaine problem, I have cocaine use disorder, or like you diagnose that, nobody really just comes out with it, um, and I also have ADHD, and I have um, social anxiety, right? I use coke to help with the social anxiety, and the ADHD has always been there since I was a child. Um, well, the problem that they're seeking help for is probably the cocaine use, right? So we would start our list with cocaine use disorder, followed by, um, we'll say, social anxiety because it's maybe inhibiting his job or it's uh, kind of acting comorbidly with the cocaine use. And then ADHD is not a concern at all, so it goes at the bottom of the list. So you're literally just making a list of diagnoses starting with the one that you're going to address first. And we're going to, I have examples we're going to go over. So for each diagnosis in your DSM, you can look up any one of them that you want. These are at a minimum the features that you're going to see. It starts with the criteria, right? These are the criteria for this diagnosis diagnostic features, which is really a description of um, a, a more narrative description of the criteria, right? So it might say, feel sad more days than not, and then diagnostic features will say, feel sad, bummed out, apathetic, right? It kind of makes a narrative of the criteria. Associated features, so here are some other things you can expect with this disorder or that are common. Prevalence rates, <coughs> development and course, right? So what is going to happen? Cultural related issues, functional consequences. So for some of these, the consequences are very obvious, right? If I say alcohol use disorder, what do you think some of the consequences are? And a lot of you will say there's legal stuff or it ruins the relationship or health concerns. But if I said, um, you know, what are the functional consequences of uh, 
you know, parasomnias, right? nightmare disorder, uh, you might say, oh, well, then, you know, you're tired because you're always having nightmares. But we need something more than that, right? So it gives examples of maybe what to ask your client. Really important, if you take nothing else away today, which hopefully this is not the only thing that you take away today, is that you have a differential list in your DSM. Now, differential list is a list of um, all the other things that could be. And so this is how you start making a diagnosis, right? You listen to your client or you read the case study and then you make a list. Write down, I tell everybody, write down everything you think it might be. Don't, don't even waste the time yet trying to figure out how right or wrong you are. Just write it down. That's your differential list. This is everything I'm considering. Then you go through the DSM and you start knocking them off the list. The DSM for every diagnosis gives you a built-in differential list like, hey, before you diagnose this, look at these other things, and it tells you what the difference is. Isn't that great? That's super handy. And comorbidity, right? Other diagnoses that might play off of whichever one you're looking at. So if you're going to follow along with me, um, and I encourage you to do it, in your DSM, we're going to look at binge eating disorder, a new one, um, on page 350. I'll meet you there. Um, so let's look at this. Well, let me highlight. Ah, oh, yes. So first we have the name of the disorder, binge eating disorder. This is the DSM code. Remember that I talked about last week, it was ICD-11 compatible. This code 307.51 means binge eating disorder in the DSM. This code, F50.8, means binge eating disorder in the ICD. Right. So if you are in an agency or at a place that requires you to use the ICD, they're compatible. So instead of putting in 307, you'd put in F50. I'm less concerned, like for the sake of the class, I'm less concerned with these two i want you in your responses to case studies to write down the code because i think it's good practice um, right now all you need to know is that this code means dsm and this code is the corresponding code in icd so now we've got our um, diagnostic criteria right that's this and this is where you're going to spend most of your time in the dsm right this tells you what you need to know. If you're gonna diagnose binge eating disorder, these are the symptoms. And so we won't go in depth about binge eating right now, that's later on in the, the eating and feeding section. Right now, what I want you to know is that um, the DSM is a go or no go type situation. Um, you either meet the criteria and you have the diagnosis or you do not, right, that's it. So here it says recurrent episodes of binge eating as characterized by both of the following. So eating a large amount of food in a discrete period of time and a sense of lack of control, right? So, you know, every year in New York, they have that hot dog eating contest, right? Well, that would fulfill this one, right? Eating a lot, like I had 23 hot dogs in four minutes, but I was in control the whole time because I was trying to get that belt right? I was trying to win the championship. So we have to have both of these. As soon as you say, no, it's not there, the whole thing is done, right? The binge eating episodes are associated with three or more, right? And then they give you this list of five. So you got to have at least three. And different diagnoses will have different combinations, different thresholds. But that's what this is. When they say you need to have X out of Y symptoms, that's a threshold. Some have very high thresholds and some have very low thresholds. <clears throat> but whatever it is, you have to meet that, that threshold. And then some of the stuff you're going to see in every diagnosis. Mark distress regarding the binge eating is present, right? Um, it, might have, it might say things, there's distress, there's um, interference with academic, vocational, or interpersonal uh, relationships. 
But this thing is saying there's a problem. Here, in this case, the problem is the distress. The binge eating occurs on average at least once a week. Remember how I told you about persistence? We need to see two things at least once a week for three months. Now you might be saying, but what if this guy comes in and he meets all the criteria, but it's only been there for two months? What do you think you should do? That's right. You make a provisional diagnosis. We're waiting on information. Um, the binge eating is not associated with compensatory behavior, right? That would be bulimia. Then we have what are called specifiers, right? Specify if the person's in partial remission. I already went over that in the other video. Specify if they're in full remission. And then specify current severity, right? Um, mild, in this case, the way they're saying mild, moderate, severe, extreme, right? Mild would be one to three times per week, moderate four to seven, severe eight to 13, and extreme 14 or more. So remember when I was saying that the severity will mean different things per diagnosis here, it's based on the binge eating, right? Not the size of the meal or how the person feels, but how many binge episodes did they have? And they give you the number range, right? So mild for binge eating disorder is not the same as like mild for depression, right? Or schizophrenia or something like that. Our diagnostic features, right? And you'll see that they kind of walk you through the criteria, right? It says criterion D at least once per week for three months. We can go back up here and see that's the same thing. So it's just adding detail to those criteria because this top part, these are kind of boxes that you're checking and there can be some subjectivity to it. They give examples, right? And it kind of goes through it. Some are very long, some are very short. Associated features. Um, and this is just kind of like, hey, by the way, binge eating occurs in normal weight, overweight, and obese individuals. Um, most obese individuals do not engage in recurrent binge eating, et cetera. So it's just some other things, other details. Prevalence, and these will also vary in length. Development and course, little is known about the development of binge eating disorder. So kind of pop quiz, why do you think that is? Because it's a new disorder. It's been around, the phenomenon's been around forever, um, since the 50s at least, but, um, and this is like, just an aside, taking it down the rabbit hole, um, it's only been diagnosable since 2013, so um, all that time before 2013, I could have been describing it as binge eating disorder, and you could have been describing it as, uh, you know, maybe an impulse control problem, or just someone who loves eating, you know, you weren't diagnosing or I was misdiagnosing. Um, dieting follows the development, etc. Risk and prognostic, cultural issues. Oh, look at that. Happens in the U.S. Who would have thought? Functional consequences of binge eating disorder. Um, let's see. Social role adjustment problems health-related quality of life and life satisfaction, medical morbidity and mortality, health care utilization, etc. And then the really big important thing, differential diagnosis. So a person comes in and says, I binge eat. And binge, you know, that word binge, um, a lot of people are familiar with. So some people hear binge and they might immediately think bulimia, which is what it is traditionally associated with. And so it tells you here, uh, bulimia nervosa is something you should consider. Let's see. But uh, bulimia comes with inappropriate compensatory behavior. And binge eating disorder also differs from bulimia in terms of response to treatment, right? Which is important. Like these are not the same thing. So if you misdiagnose, and this applies to other diagnoses, when we misdiagnose, we're also not given good help. 
obesity, bipolar disorder, borderline, right? So it says, hey, look at these other things, and here's what's different, right? And that can help. I still do that, right? I've been practicing for like 10 years, and um, every once in a while, I'll have to look more than every once in a while, to be honest, look and say, I'm between these two or maybe even three, and looking, and here we find like the really fine detail that helps us understand um, the difference. I hope that was helpful kind of looking at that since we can't be in class and I can't you know, show you the, the DSM. So recording, how do we record or write the diagnosis? And so this applies to real life and for the class, for your case studies and the um, midterm and the final. So let's look at what I'm calling a simple recording. And by simple, I mean there's not a bunch of, there's no specifiers. So this is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, it is new to the DSM. Um, and so here it's where someone has a, like essentially throws a tantrum. Um, here are our criteria, right? Here's the name. Here's our DSM code, our ICD code. And then we start going through the criteria. Um, recurrent outbursts that are grossly out of proportion and intensity to the provocation, right? So somebody, you ask for Dr. Pepper and they bring you Coke, so like you flip the table over, right? The outbursts are inconsistent with developmental age. Well, like if you have a four-year-old and they want Sprite and they got Coke and they freak out, we'd probably give them a pass. It happens three or more times a week. The mood between temper is irritable or angry most of the day. Here's our time, present for symptoms A through A through D, are present for 12 or more months. Um, at least two settings. Here's, and again, this is, you know, the devil's in the detail. The first time before age of six, the diagnosis should not be made for the first time before age six. I'll let you think about why, because I'm going to ask that question when we get to this disorder more in depth. Or after age 18. Let's see. The disorder, the behaviors don't occur exclusively during major depressive disorder or and are not explained by another mental disorder such as autism, PTSD, separation, anxiety, etc., Right? And you will see that on every diagnosis, that these symptoms are not better explained by another diagnosis. And the symptoms are not attributable to substances or um, medical or neurological conditions. So someone does this, you find out it's a teenager and they, they got into the old liquor cabinet and so they're, they're wild and out, right? So we're not attributing it to that. So you decide to give this diagnosis. What you would write down is the code, right? Here's our code, 29699. Can I go back, right? I got, where did I get that? Right here. And then the name. You'll see that this has no specifiers. That's it. If you're diagnosing this, you're done. This is it. The code and the name. Now you want to make multiple diagnoses. Remember I said we're putting the one on top that is of present concern. So let's say we're working with a, a child. We've diagnosed him with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, right? And we're also going to diagnose him with dyslexia. That's what this, this is the long name for dyslexia. Specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. So here's just kind of a, in, in this fictitious case study, why did we put disruptive mood dysregulation disorder on top? Um, a student with dyslexia and disruptive mood, the dyslexia is serious and it's problematic. Nobody denies that, but he's working through it. However, he has these frequent um, disproportionate outbursts at school, and then that gets him sent home, and that keeps him from receiving the services to help with the dyslexia. So we're putting this one up here because we can't work on this one 
because this one keeps getting in the way, right? The situation is going to be based on your client. There is no inherent ranking of disorders, right? There's no rule that says, well, if they have this, this one has to go on top. It is based on the context of your client. So again, we put code, name, code, name, and that's it. So now, so it seems easy enough, you've got it. So now let's look at something a little more complex. Specifiers. For your case studies and for the exams and everything like that, you need to put the specifiers, right? Um, there are several where if you said moderate and I, I thought it was mild, that part I'm less concerned about. If you were supposed to put some sort of severity and you didn't put anything, then then that's a you know that's a problem. So some will have you specify remission, severity, subtype, or features. It's different for each diagnosis. You have to look at each one individually. Don't assume this is a detail game, right? So let's look at bulimia, right? So name codes, criteria. Now it says, specify if in partial remission, specify if in full remission, specify current severity, mild, moderate, severe, extreme. Oops, wrong way. Oh my goodness, where's my slide? There we go. So this person with bulimia comes in for the very first time, right? And so we say 30751, bulimia nervosa, nervosa, moderate. Why did we put that? Oh my goodness, where's my slide? Because it says we put the code, the name, specify, are they in full remission? No. That would mean that all their symptoms are gone for a sustained period of time. Are they in partial remission? No, because they're just now coming in. So all the symptoms are present. So we don't put any. Specify current severity. And we put moderate. Let's, they, they use compensatory behaviors five times a week. All right, so that would be there. Now let's say after lots of treatment, they're feeling better, they're coming in and they just say, you know, I'm just feeling kind of stressed out, I'm feeling out of sorts, I just don't wanna relapse, right? Well then we're looking at, okay, the code, the name, they once met all the criteria and no longer do for a while, so now we can say in full remission, right? So you're just, it's like, it's like following a recipe in a cookbook, you're just going through that and addressing every point. So now let's look at what I think is one of the more complicated ones in the DSM, autism, right? So uh, I, I would venture to guess that nearly everybody, if not literally everybody in this class has heard of autism, right? So this is a very common diagnosis. So here we have the, the uh, code, our name, here's our first specifier, right? The level of the severity for communication the severity for behavior with or without intellectual impairment, with or without accompanying language impairment. So that's one, two, three, four, at least four specifiers, right? So again, I'm pointing this out because I want you to get into the habit of looking at all those details. So here is the criteria for autism. You see right here, it says, specify the current severity of social communication, right? And it tells you what do they mean by that, the social, emotional, uh, reciprocity, nonverbal communication behaviors, um, understanding relationships, give a severity, and then it tells you, go look at this table for the rankings, restricted, repetitive behaviors, right? The stereotyped movements, insistence on sameness, uh, restricted interests, hyper or hypo reactivity, now give a severity for that, right? And a lot of students, I don't know why, because I make this comment every semester, 
you've got to address both of these and then still half half of everybody doesn't then specify and get this this one says specify with or without well you only have two options like it is either with or without accompanying intellectual impairment so here you're either going to say yeah there is an intellectual impairment or there is not there is language impairment or there is not is there a known medical condition is there another neurodevelopmental issue like ADHD or global developmental delay with catatonia, right? So this one has several specifiers, all right? So let's go back here, right? So here was requiring support for social communication, right? The reciprocity, the relationships, the restricted repetitive behavior, the intellectual impairment and the language impairment. So the takeaway right now is that different disorders have different specifiers and they range from not having a specifier section at all to having a great deal of specifiers. And if it says you need to address them, then you need to address them. Another section of the uh, DSM when you're in these chapters, right, it goes through all the different um, disorders, right? So if you go to feeding and eating disorders, which is where we find uh, binge eating disorder and bulimia, you go through it. Then we come to a section that's called other specified feeding or eating disorders. And these are kind of the lesser known uh, disorders in a section, right? This category applies to presentations in which symptoms, uh, characteristic of feeding and eating disorders that causes stress, etc., but do not meet the full criteria for any of the disorders in this class. And every section of the DSM will have this. You will have one for um, other specified personality disorders, other specified bipolar disorders, other specified uh, somatic disorders. And then it gives you a couple of examples, atypical anorexia, uh, binge eating where it's low frequency, um, purging disorder. So someone who they don't binge, but they do purge, right? So these are just some other ones that are other specified. They all have the same code. And then finally, every section has this unspecified disorders, right? This category applies to presentations in which symptoms, characteristics of a feeding and eating disorder. So I have a client where the issue is clearly around food and eating that causes a problem, but do not meet the full criteria for any of the disorders in this class. The unspecified feeding and eating disorder category is used in situations in which the clinician chooses not to specify the reason that the criteria are not met for a specific disorder and includes presentations in which there is insufficient information to make a more specific diagnosis. So if you're at an emergency room, right, and someone came in and um, you were able to rule out substances because they did a drug test um, they're not presenting as manic or depressed and they attempted to kill themselves and you can't figure out, well, which one of these is, but it seems like it's personality related. You might put it's an unspecified personality disorder because I can't get any information or for whatever reason I'm choosing to withhold it. So let's wrap up. You can only diagnose disorders that are in the DSM, right? You can't like... Don't make one up. The criteria are the rules. Use the differential list, right, that's there. So when you have a client or you have a case study, so this is your study strategy for this, make a list, you highlight the details, make a list of everything that you think it could be, and then you go through the DSM and start ruling out those other diagnoses. Recording procedures are different between diagnoses meaning they have different specifiers, and 
even if there are similar specifiers, they might have different definitions and different rules. So take your time and really explore those details. That's going to do it for this week. I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know, and I'll see you next time.